Good evening, good evening. Okay, I will, I will read the, tonight, this evening, the lesson five. I have read the lesson six this afternoon. For some days, I I will try to record two videos each day, because if I don't do not, if I do not do that, I won't have time to finish before. Um, my period of time at the home of my mother uh, for the Christmas time. Okay, so now it's the lesson five, the keys to the kingdom. Beloved friends, we come forth in this lesson to continue that pathway which builds the structure, the highway, by which you may learn to follow and therefore master the way of the heart. A way in life means to have chosen from all possibilities that one which will stand, stand out as the way to which you are committed, the way to which you devote the whole of your attention by granting your willingness that the way be followed. Just as when you take a journey upon your earth, by making the commitment to take the journey, you avail yourselves of experience that could not come to you in any other way. When you go to a university to pursue a de degree, although you begin with a certain idea of what the pathway may hold or bring you, is it not true that the relationships which come along the way, the knowledge, the, the knowledge that reveals itself to you, and even the end result of accomplishing the degree always seems to be different and much richer than you could have imagined when you began your journey. Therefore, understand well that the way of the heart requires the willingness to commit Commitment is nothing more than a deliberate decision that something will be so. Just as with all aspects of experience you have ever known, when all of your being is involved in the willingness to make a decision, there is literally nothing that can prevent you from the accomplishment of your goal. Rest assured, whenever you believe you have not succeeded or not completed some decision fueled by desire, it is because you were simply not wholly committed or you decided to change your mind. And when you change your mind, you literally change what you experience in the world or the solar system in which yourself spins. The way of the heart, then, does indeed require the decision of commitment. I say unto you that when you wholly commit to discovering the way of the heart, you will discover a way of being in the world that is not here. You will discover a way of walking through life in which you experience being uplifted by something that seems to be forever beyond you, yet is within you as the core and the essence of your very being. Your way will not be understandable by the world. Your way will not even be comprehensible within yourself. You will be living from mystery, moving from mystery to mystery to mystery, uplifted and carried by something that brings a satisfaction and a fulfillment to the depth of your soul, far, far beyond anything you can now imagine. I think I have not precise the date. We are Thursday the 17th day of December 2015. It's important for me to give the date to situate each video in the process of time. It is worth it, is worth it to commit to the way of the heart. Yes, it culminates with the recognition that you do not live life at all, but rather that life is living you. One of its characteristics is the development of the witness a quality of consciousness, a way of being in which you seem to be witnessing everything 
that arises and flows through you and around you from a place of utter stillness. Stillness does not mean non-activity. It does mean non-attachment to activity, whether it be the arising and falling away of cancer in the body, the arising and falling away of relationship, or the rising and falling away of a solar system. You will discover that there is a place within you that can look upon all things with perfect equanimity, perfect acceptance and perfect love. For in mastery of the will of the heart, you will discover that nothing is unacceptable to you. Only what is accepted can be transcended. You will discover a way of being in which nothing any longer compels you, not even the desire to know God compels you any longer, for the need of it has been completed. Then there arises a way of being in the world that is indeed not here, for you will feel no restlessness, no need to direct your journey. No questions will arise. You will be at peace. In that peace, the breath of God will move through you, and you will become as the wind, no wind not where you came from or where you are going, but you will abide in perfect trust and perfect rest. The world may not know you, but your father or your mother will know you, and you will know your God. In the way of the heart, the most primary and fundamental perception that seems to fuel ordinary human consciousness has been finally transcended. The perception of a separate maker and doer has been dissolved, and once again you will understand the depth and the profundity of the simple terms in this sentence. Of myself I do nothing, but through me the father, the mother, does all things. To rest in such a perception means that you have come to realize that the self that you are is merely a conduit through which mystery lives itself, through which love pours forth. You will realize that there is nothing to be gained or lost in this world. You will know what it means to recognize that you literally have nowhere to go and nothing to achieve. You will become empty and spacious. And yet, paradoxically, while the body lasts, you will appear to be as everyone else. You will arise in the morning and brush your teeth. When the body is hungry, you will, feel, you will feed it. You will laugh with your friends. You will yawn when the body is a bit tired. Yet, through it all, there will be a quality of awareness called the witness that is simply watching it all, waiting to be moved by the wind of spirit. Though others may not see it, virtually everything you utter will carry the sound of truth. You will not know how spirit will work through you, nor, nor will you care, because you see, when there is no maker or doer or director, it will not matter to you. That is what it means to live as a wind, for the wind does not concern itself with where it has been or where it is going. It is moved by some mysterious, mysterious source that cannot be located at all. Yet it blows, and as it blows, its effect is experienced. Imagine then a life in which all that you do is not for yourself. Imagine a way of life in which what you do is not for anyone else. Imagine a way of life in which creativity flows, flows forth from a source so deep within you and around you that no language or dogma can contain it, a force and a source that knows how to express itself through you in such a way that it is constantly and only serving the atonement, the awakening of all of creation to the truth of God's presence. The way of the heart does, indeed, unfold along a certain pathway. In this lesson, we will address the stages of that pathway in a general sense. Then we will speak of the most important characteristic to be cultivated along this path. The first key, key is desire. First, desire is everything. Without it, not a thing can arise. Therefore, 
What you desire is of utmost importance. Desire then perfect union with God. Desire then to be Christ incarnate. Desire then to be all that your Creator has created you to be, even if you have no idea what that might be. For when you hold desire within your beingness, and when you have mastered the energy of desire, again, mastery does not mean control, by grounding it always in the desire to be as you are created to be. Then indeed, all of your life and all of the subsequent or subsidiary desires will come to serve that grand desire. When you come into that state of being, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Why? Because you are not the one doing it, you are merely a piece of thread in a very cosmic tapestry, being woven by the creator of all of creation, who alone knows how to wave the tapestry of a new age, of a new paradigm, of a healing of this plane and of humanity. So the first stage in the stage is the stage of desire. Only by feeling desire and not by suppressing it can you truly begin to move toward the stage of mastery in which the energy of desire always serves that high, higher will which is the will of God for you. As we have said to you before, when your will is in alignment with the will of God, you will discover that God's will for you is that you be genuinely happy through and through content, fulfilled, at peace, empowered, capable and responsible. The second key, key is intention. Desire in time is cultivated through intention, for you have used time to teach yourself how to be, to be distracted by all of the thoughts and perceptions that make up this cosmic soup called your world. All of you have known the frustration of having a desire and then as soon as you walk out the door, a friend pulls up and says, let's go to the beach and you never make it to class even though your desire is to get the de degree. You have cultivated the art of being seduced by distraction. Therefore, it is necessary to utilize time to cultivate intention, for without intention, desire cannot become the crystal clear focus, the laser-like focus that can cut through the dross of this world so that a new creation can flow forth through you. Intention is not the same as holding a strong egoic or willed commitment to making something happen. For the will of the heart recognizes that you have not known how to achieve the fulfillment you seek at the level of the soul, for the simple reason that if you did, you would have already accomplished it. Intention does not mean putting your nose to the grindstone and not taking no for an answer. Rather, it means that you cultivate within your thought process the art of remembering what you are truly here for. You are here to remember that you are the thought of love in form. You are here to remember that you are one with God. You are here to remember that what I have called Abba, though it goes, it goes by many names, is the source of your only reality. You are living in reality only to the degree that 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 one is living through you. Therefore, intention in the way of the heart means to utilize time each day to focus your attention on the desire to be Christ incarnate. Intention is that energy or that use of the mind that creates through consistent practice the channel through which desire begins to move down and re-educate the emotional body and even the cellular structure of the physical body and all of the lesser avenue of thinking that occur within the intellect. So everything involved in your being is integrated, working together and focused on the fulfillment of that one grand desire to accept your function in this world. 
Your function is healing your sense of separation from God. How do you apply intention? Each day, just as you have used time to teach yourself to be easily distracted, you need only ask yourself one question daily. What is it that I most desire? What am I doing on this planet? What am I committed to? The last two questions are just forms of the fundamental question. As you keep practicing asking that question, the answer will become clearer and clearer, for it is the question that influences, stimulates and gives birth to the answer. The universe is always answering your questions, and when you ask unclear questions, you get unclear answers. Therefore, become crystal clear with your intention and remind yourself of it daily. My intention is to use time constructively for the, re the relearning of what it means to abide in the kingdom of heaven or in the kingdom of heaven and to fulfill my function. My function is healing, and healing requires the presence of Christ, for only Christ can express the love that brings healing into being. Desire and intention are critical. These stages unfold in the field of time as one matures in the way of the heart. Just a second. The third key is allowance. The third stage of the process whereby the mind is wholly corrected and one returns home is the stage of allowance, for the egoic world does not teach you to allow, it teaches you to strive. You must be the maker and the doer. You must find a way to manipulate or control your environment in order that it conform itself to the image that you are holding in your mind. All of that is well and good, and there are many beings that learn some valuable lessons by following the path of certain teachers that will teach you that you can create whatever you want that will seem like such a big deal until you realize it is what you are doing all of the time. You are always creating exactly what you decree. It is no big deal and it is not a secret. But there will be those that will teach you, well, just go into your mind, ask yourself what you want, and when you see that picture of the Mercedes, then you simply do all of these little magical tricks and pretty soon you end up with a Mercedes. The problem with that, although it can be a useful stage, is that the intellect, the worldly part of your mind, can only desire what it has been programmed to desire. The worldly part of your mind says, well, I have to transport my body around in this plane. Automobiles do that. The world tells me that a Mercedes is a grand way of doing this. Therefore, I will create the desire of wanting a Mercedes. When you manifest the Mercedes, you fool yourself into thinking that you have made great progress when, in fact, all you have done is done what you have always done. You have chosen what your experience will be and you have manifested it. There is nothing new about that, about that, although by so doing you can begin to regain confidence in your ability to manifest. The way of the heart is about something else. Allowance in this pathway means that you begin to view your life differently. It is not a struggle to get out of high school and create a career by which you can create golden coins, by which you can create the proper house in the proper environment so that your ego feels successful and therefore of being worth love. Be honest with yourself. Is not your world built on such premises as these? If only I can make my life look successful around me, then I will be accepted, then I can love myself at least a little. Maybe I can get other people to love me. That is not it all. That is not it at all. At all. It's not a question. That is not it at all. 
The way of the heart begins with the recognition that you are already loved by the only source that matters, that you have come for a much higher purpose than can be made manifest in the ways of the world, but is not of the world. Allowance is a cultivation of a way of looking at the events of your life, not as obstacles to getting what you want, but as, but as stepping stones. Each one presents you with a blessing of the lessons required to heal the obstacles, not to success, but to the presence of love as the source and ground of your being. In the stage of allowance, we begin to cultivate an an acceptance of all things in our experience. We begin to see that because we have made a commitment to awakening and incarnating only Christ, the universe is already conspiring to bring the people and events into our lives on a moment-to-moment -moment basis that can best provide us with exactly what we most need to learn or become aware of. And so, messengers are sent. That messenger could come in the form of someone whom you fall in love with, and there is something there for you to learn. It could be that you have been blocking yourself from feeling love for other people, and now someone finally comes that blasts down the door, and you cannot help but feel that feeling. The messenger could be someone who comes as the grain of sand within the oyster that causes friction within you that nudges you from your sleep and you realize that you have been operating out of some very dysfunctional patterns and that you have got to get a better grip upon the truth of who you are. It may be that you need to learn to express your feelings more. It may be that you need to accept your own creativity more. Through your messengers, that which causes you to finally be responsible and be honest about where you are, will be brought up within you. For instance, if you think, well, I never get angry anymore. After all, I'm a very spiritual person. I just got out of seminary and I know it all now, so I'll just live in heavenly bliss. And events begin to happen. Perhaps, as an example, a gay couple moves into your neighborhood and you discover that you have some very deeply seated perceptions that there is something wrong with that sexual orientation. They are messengers sent to you by the universe to push you to look more deeply. Allowance, then, is a cultivation of a quality of awareness in which you rest in the recognition that your life is no longer your own to dictate and control, but that rather you have given it over to the source of your own beingness, to that depth of wisdom in the depth of the ocean that knows best how to bring about what is required to push up the dross from within your consciousness so that you can release it. Allowance cultivates trust. Allowance is the way in which intention and desire come to work ever more fully in the third dimension of your experience, the field of time. Allowance is a submission, but not a naive submission. Allowance changes your perception of what you see as the world around you. You begin to realize that you do not really live in a real world at all. You live in a field of vibrations and energies that is operated by the law of attraction or resonance. And you begin to be willing to allow certain things to fall out of your life, even family and friends, trusting that because of your desire and intention, what passes out of your life must be okay for it will be replaced by new vibrational patterns which come in which come in the form of messengers events pla places persons and things that can carry you on the upward spiral of awakening allowance means the beginning stages of the cultivation of humility and the recognition that you must finally submit to something beyond the intellect and the control of the egoic part of the mind, 
because the maker and doer that has been trying to do it all is finally recognized as being inadequate. The fourth key is surrender. As these three stages mature, you rest into the final stage of surrender, and surrender means there is no longer any restlessness. Surrender means you know through every fiber of your being that there is no one here living a life. There is life flowing through the body-mind personality for as long as it lasts. Here is where the mystical transformation is culminated or completed. It is here that you understand the meaning of the teaching, I live yet not I, but Christ dwells as me. Surrender is a stage in which perfect peace is the foundation, not for passivity or inactivity, but for even more activity. You find yourself, as long as you are in the world, being busier and busier and asked to do more and more. You become even more responsible. Eventually, you come to see that because you are Christ, you are responsible for the whole of creation. You come to see that you cannot think a thought without disturbing the farthest of stars. It is that responsibility from which you have shrunk and tried to contain yourself as a teeny myopic piece of foam, all because you have feared being responsible for the whole. But the way of the heart corrects your perception so that you come to recognize that your greatest joy, your greatest fulfillment, is in wholly and deliberately accepting responsibility for the whole of creation. Why? Because you suddenly realize you are not the maker and doer that you can accept responsibility for anything and everything because through you all power under heaven and earth is made to flow to manifest the love of God. So in short, it is in God's hand, not your hands, not yours. Not my will, but then be done. Does that begin to make sense to you? Do you see how it changes how you have even been taught to interpret my teachings? Desire, intention, allowance, surrender. But it is a surrender into a way of being that the world can never know. It is surrender into a way of being in which you may never receive an Oscar for your acting. But it is a way of being in which you con your consciousness becomes totally open to your union with all of creation. You will talk with a leaf as it falls from a tree. You will see the so soul of the kitten that you pet. You will talk with angels and masters and you will be involved in board meetings in the high cosmic conference rooms. You will know that the body-mind you once thought was yours is little more than, than a temporary de teaching device, a tool to be picked up and utilized at God's direction and put aside when its usefulness is done, so that even when it is time to go through the transition that you know as death, Nothing will disturb your peace. As the body dies, which means simply that your attention begins to release itself from it, just like the hand of a carpenter, carpenter is released from the handle of a hammer as it is let, let down on the table on the way to dinner, you will be able to watch the process with total equanimity and joy. You will watch your spirit disengage from the body. You will watch it crumble into lifelessness so that all of your attention becomes focused in a wholly new dimension, a dimension that is so vast that you will be able to look down upon the earth plane, not unlike the way you might choose to hold a pebble in the palm of your hand. And in one quick glance, you see everything about the pebble and nothing is hidden. I am one that has cho chosen to assume the responsibility for the pebble called earth and all of life that dwells therein. You too will know 
that energy and reality of wrapping your fingers around the entirety of the solar system and becoming the god or the savior of that dimension. And it begins by choosing to take responsibility for your pebble, your domain, your solar system, your personal dimension. It begins by saying, I and I alone am the source of what I experience and perceive. I am not a victim of the world I see. Everything I experience I have called to myself, plain and simple. No excuses, no ifs, ands or buts. That is the way it is. Gone will be your immaturity, your resistance to simply being responsible for your experience. The way of the heart then cultivates a maturity of desire, intention, allowance and surrender. The importance of humility. No single char characteristic is of greater importance than humility. Not the famed humility that is taught in certain world religions, but a genuine humility. For humility does not mean that you stand in front of a group of people who give you a standing ovation and say, oh gosh, you don't have to do that, it's not important so that you can look like you are humble when inwardly you are thinking, oh God, that feels so good. Clap a little louder, clap a little longer, but I won't tell you that. Do you know that kind of humility? It is not that kind of humility you were taught in your schools. Genuine humility flows from the deep-seated recognition that you cannot save yourself, that you are created and not creator, that you are effect and not cause, in an absolute sense, that something called life is not yours, that there is something beyond your capacity of containment and, and intellectual understanding. And if that something ever decided to give up loving you, you would cease to be. No matter how deep you go into the death of God, and no matter how deep you achieve an awareness and consciousness of union with God, what God is remains forever beyond your growing capacity to understand God. It's like an ocean of infinite death. When you realize that strive as you might, you will never wrap yourself, your little self, around that source. You will rest into humility, genuine humility. Why is this important? Mark these words well. As you progress along the path of the way of the heart, as you dissolve, dissolve and loosen the shackles upon the mind, as the interior conflicts are healed and settled, as you begin to accept the abundance that the father or the mother would bestow upon you in all levels of life and all levels of feeling and perception, as you begin to taste of the grandeur and the greatness that would flow through you, you will discover that the enemies becomes, become more subtle. At a very immature, basic and naive level, every child views, at some stage, its parents as being its enemies, does it not? For example, the child says, What do you mean I can't have the car tonight? What do you mean I must be home by 10 p.m.? And the parent becomes the enemy. As you move more and more into mastery, you will, you will be sorely tempted to believe that you are done. You will be sorely tempted to believe, I can do this. The prayers I used to do when I began, the simple exercises of awareness I used when I started my path, I don't need them anymore. I have mastered that. Anytime you hear a voice within yourself saying, I'm done, you may rest assured you are not, and you stand in danger of losing what you have gained. Humility is the recognition that the more you move into mastery, the more there is the desire for discipline and vigilance. Discipline does not mean doing something hard that you do not like to do. Discipline is like the skill of an artist that cultivates and refines the skill simply out of the deep desire and delight to create more beautifully. An athlete disciplines a muscle 
so that the muscle works even more beautifully than it did the day before, out of the sheer delight to extend greater beauty into the world. While you remain in existence, the creations of consciousness that are unlike love have created a, a whole lot of vibrator, vibratory patterns that would just love to pull you down. Therefore, the discipline of the mind that is required is to recognize that while the body lasts, there can be a delight in consciously repeating the decision to teach only love, selectively choosing only the vibrational patterns to be allowed into your consciousness that reflect the truth and the beauty and the worthiness of who you truly are. Judgment cannot reflect such light. Anger and hatred, hatred cannot do it. Fear and paranoia, fear of rejection, fear of the opinions of others, and such vibrations can never reflect the regal grandeur of your being. Therefore, understand well that humility is absolutely essential. Paradoxically, as greatness is expressed through you, the temptation still will be to allow egoic energies to make a home in your mind. The ego's voice will say, Boy, you are really quite a master, you know. You really deserve all this adulation. Why don't you keep 10% of it for yourself? A master accepts the love and the gratitude offered by those whom his or her teachings have touched and gives it all to God, recognizing that of themselves these things could not have been done. I learned too to be tempted. When those who'd come to me who were sick found healing in my presence, it was tempting to want to say, yes, look what I have done. I've really earned this. I spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. I've been to India and Tibet. I've been to England. I've studied with all of the masters of Egypt. Yes, I really deserve to be seen as a healer and a teacher. But I learned through humility to remember the simplicity that of myself I can do nothing. I cultivated within myself the art of always being a student of love and not the professor of love who thinks he is done just because he has a lot of letters after his name. As you progress and as you all do more of the abundance of God's love to flow through you, you begin to stand up out of the crowd and you begin to attract those that want the light. As that occurs, you must practice discipline and vigilance by remembering humility always until you are remembering it with every breath. Why? If you are living in this world and feel that no one looks up to you, no one takes you as an authority, there is only one reason. You have resisted the truth of your being and through Daniel have pushed God's, God's light away out of your fear, your deep-seated fear that you might appear to be different that, than everybody else. The world would teach you to be a doormat so that you fit in and do not ruffle anybody's feathers. But as you become empowered, one way you will know that it is occurring is that some people will not like you. You will push their buttons just by walking into the room, for darkness abhors light. It is that simple. Humility is absolutely essential. Through the doorway of humility, the light of power can be turned on through you in ever greater voltages. If that voltage does not seem to be flowing through your mind, look well to see if you are rem remembering humility and giving yourself to it. For the light of God can only shine through you to the degree that you are willing to take responsibility for it, which involves giving the fruits of it back to its source and not claiming it as your own. When you claim nothing for yourself, all things can flow through you. The Holy Spirit can gather millions of beings to come to you in many planes because it knows you will not distort the love of God by usurping God's position and putting yourself upon the throne. 
Humility is a chief characteristic to cultivate. Therefore, when you pray, indeed, ask for greatness. Let the father or the mother know that you are ready for the fullness of Christ to be incarnate and simply hold the promise within that you will always remember that you are not the doer and the maker. You are merely the one who has come to recognize that only the love of God can fulfill you as a soul. Only the fulfillment of your purpose to be a channel for love can bring you the success that you truly seek. When you are fully committed to that, rather than being committed to wondering about other people's opinion, then that power can begin to move through you. When you are willing to let go of the world, he heaven will come to replace it. When you are willing to let go of your need for egoic grandness, true grandeur will begin to pour forth through you. There is a paradox within spirit. Learn to discern it. Become a master of it. And never neglect the need for discipline based on the foundation of humility. You see, this is what has caused you to fear the energy of desire, because in the past, and that can go back a long way, you have decided to find out what it would be like to let all of the power be claimed as your own, to be used to serve the voice of ego, that is what you are afraid of. But if you cultivate these stages and ground them in humility, you will never need to fear the misuse of desire. Therefore, in your prayers, as often as you can remember to do so, remember that what you decree is, so speak clearly within yourself. Source, Creator, God, Goddess, all that is, Abba, I am ready to be what you created me to be. I choose to remember that I am effect and not cause. Thy will be done knowing that your will is my full happiness. Reveal then that path through which that happiness can be known, for my way has never worked, but your way always does. Then, in each day, remember the energy of appreci appreci appreciation. <laughs> Not sure of the pronunciation. It is well and good to appreciate one another. But in the privacy of your own meditation and prayer, appreciate how the power of that source of love I have called God is living and moving and breathing to bring the people, the books, the teachers and the experiences that are gently unraveling the cocoon of ego around you and awakening you to the truth, beauty, majesty, grandeur and greatness that life itself is. Life wants to breathe through you as magically and powerfully as it breathes through a thunderstorm or the leaf of a tree or the radiance in a newborn baby's eyes. That life is what you are. That life is the presence of God's love, the death of the ocean welling up into the waves of creation. It's the two last pages. Let therefore that life alone be your guide in all things and rest in appreciation before the infinite mystery that life is and say yes to it. Say yes to life that you are willing to let the fullness of it wash through you and carry you into an ever deepening understanding and comprehension of all that God is. If you would well receive it, resting in the awareness of divine humility is the sweetest of experiences that you can ever know. Many of you look upon me and say, Oh, would I ever love to be where Je Yeshua is. Think a thought and you are with someone. Think a thought and you are in that universe. I tell you this, where I abide is in a vibrational frequency with many, many other beings whose consciousness never wavers for an instant from the deep, appreciation and humility before the mystery of all that God is. We abide in the great delight of knowing that we live, yet not us, but our Creator lives as us. 
The only difference between being a master and being a student is that the master has mastered the art of always being a student. Think about that one. Desire, intention, allowance, surrender. What do you truly want? Are you willing to feel it and let that thread of desire carry your home? Can you remember to use time constructively by focusing your intention, by reminding yourself of what you are truly here for? You are not here to survive, you are here to live as the truth of who you are. Allowance is not a passive acceptance of things as they are, but a recognition that there is something quite beautiful at work. There is an intelligence, a love that knows you better than you know yourself and is presenting you moment to moment with jewels and gems and blessings and lessons that something is weaving the tapestry of your life and nothing is happening by accident. Surrender is the cultivation of the recognition that your happiness can be found only in the submission of your will to the will of God. For your will has been to be in conflict and struggle and limitation. God's will is that you live without conflict, in peace, joy, fulfillment, and happiness. It is called bliss. If ever you wonder how to anchor your awareness in humility, stop what you are doing and ask yourself this question. Did I create myself? You know well that the answer is no. I don't even know when I was created. Something broke with me. What is it? That will bring you to humility rather quickly. Do you know how to give birth to, star, to a star? No. Do you know how to give birth to a leaf on a tree? No. Do you even know how you lift your hand from your lap? No. What then do you know? Nothing. Allow yourself to understand that you do not know anything. In that state of divine ignorance, you will rest in the humility that finally allows your Creator to move through you and reveal to you all things. Beloved friends, the way of the heart is that way which corrects perception and brings right-mindedness so that you are no longer the maker and the doer and the director. Your opinions will come to mean nothing to you whatsoever. Out of a grand emptiness, you will discover a perfect peace. Life will bear you on its wings, through you. Life will express in ever greater dimensionality the exquisite and infinite love and power and creativity that is God, until you swear that God is all there is, and there will be no place to find a trace of you. For if enlightenment is the ending of separation, how can there be a may how can there be a maker and doer? Can the wave direct itself? The ego is the attempt to do so, and it always fails. Peace then, be with you always. Let peace pervade your being at all times. Know that you are safe in the love of God that arises from that great source of mystery and would move through you with every breath you breath and every word you speak until you hear only that impetus of kittens that wells up from the death of your being as a gentle voice that you trust completely, and you will know the freedom that you seek. You already abide where we are. Trust this. Know this. Rely on this. Explore the way of the heart, and you will come to know the truth of love. Be you, therefore, at peace, beloved friends. Amen. Thank you very much to be there with me for this course. I wish you a good end of evening where you are or a good end of the if it's not evening for you. I will come back tomorrow for the lesson 4. Bye bye.